Hi everyone, welcome back. Today is day two of my journey to get 1,000 subscribers in YouTube. And I'm looking at the videos, learning from the best. And one of them is that I need to up my game in getting better equipment so that my videos are, have, are sharper and cleaner. But I have, a, I have a budget, so basically I have to look at the be best recommendations and then decide according to budget. So Think Media is one of them that is very good. So that's why I am looking at learning from the best and then implement and take action. All right, let's take a look at this video. What is the best cameras and equipment for YouTube this year, depending on your budget? Well, in this video, I'm going to be breaking down in depth the best cameras, lighting, tripod, as well as everything you need to get started on YouTube. If you want to invest in not super expensive gear, but some pro gear, as well as giving some alternative recommendations. And I'm also going to be giving away a complete YouTube studio and share details about that in this video as well. But if you're new to the channel, my name is Camera. Are you currently shooting with? Um, you can grab this guy refurbished with a one year warranty off the Canon website for around $479 here in the US with the kit lens. I think that if you're shooting 1080p, it's some of the best, uh, it's one of the best cameras out there. Um, the other new, if really the new M50 is the Canon M6 Mark II. And I don't think that the M50 is a great 4K camera. It has a crazy crop factor. Video that you're going to want to watch next because. Okay, this one I really um, want to watch. If you're trying to make a decision, other one this is the video that will break it down. So you can think about the 12 things you should be thinking about. So this is the 12 camera features to. Okay, I'm going to skip to this one. Hey, question for you. Do you need help starting or growing your YouTube channel right now? If not, then just skip this video. But if the answer is yes, then you're going to want to join our free seven day YouTube challenge on the challenge. Twelve camera features to think about so you don't buy the wrong camera. You could click, uh, click the YouTube card to watch this video next um, and uh, definitely check it out because it um, will educate you if you're like, man, you, you just threw like all kinds of videos out, you know, like, Sean, which one should I really go for? This is the one um, or definitely the video that'll break down, uh, I think, uh, the distinctions about does it have IBIS? You know, is it 4K? Is it, um, does, do I need 4K? Uh, is the sensor a crop sensor or, you know, full frame and all these different questions. And so um, I'll link to that one in the description below as well. Thank you again so much for being a part of uh, this community. Smash like if you got value out of this video and check out the video with the 12 features you need to know. Just click or tap the screen. How do we get to that one? Maybe it's this one. So what is the best camera for YouTube and how do you actually choose the right? camera out of all the different cameras on the market well and in this video I'm going to be breaking down 12 camera features that you need to know about About so you don't buy the wrong camera. We're also going to be covering three tips for saving money on cam.
camera gear and how you can become the smartest person at the party that knows about cameras. In fact, maybe smarter than the camera store employee himself by going through all the different camera features that go into choosing the right camera. But if we're just meeting, my name is Sean Cannell and this channel is called Think Media and my passion is bringing you the best tips and tools for building your influence with online video. And I'm excited for today's presentation because it's really about how to choose the right camera for video. Buckle your seatbelt because we're gonna get into a lot of details in this. And uh, here at Think Media, Our mission is just simply helping you build your influence with online video and social media. And a lot of that comes into having the right tools and have opinionated. They get really fired up. They, have, they get like mad about their opinions. And I'm not here to say that I am the end all expert. He is, he's people an get expert. insane. And so we'll definitely punch you uh, out of this community if you don't treat people with respect. And the focus of this presentation is video and not photography. So and if you are about to get one, I think you're going to have the confidence to know what kind of camera you actually want to get going into the future, right? And so uh, let's dive right into this. And as a quick reminder, start with what you have. This is actually a picture of me back in 2003. You can see we're playing with cameras, all these kind of old point shoots. And uh, that's my wife, Sonia, sitting next to the budget. Obviously, you can only invest the amount of money in a camera that you have, you know? So like, write it down. Like what actually is your budget? As it doesn't have a mic input. Problem is it's amazing and small for doing action shots, but it doesn't solve every problem. But then if you go too big, you can't travel with it. So if the camera always stays at home and you never take it with you and you want to vlog, well, that's also a problem. So, so finding, it's like this, this one would be features. What features do you need? So if you want to even take notes or make, make a little notepad on your phone, you don't need all the features I'm going to talk about in this, but what features do you need? What features are a priority for you? Next would be size. I mean, of course, size is, is great. Uh, a GoPro, if, if, it could, if this little action camera could do everything that we need, then why even get a bigger camera? Problem is, like, it doesn't have zoom lens. Problem is, it doesn't have a mic input. Problem is, it, it's amazing and small for doing action shots, but it doesn't solve every problem. $300, $500. Well, if you spend all $500 on that, what about lighting? What about the audio? What about a tripod? What about SD cards or extra batteries? And now you only get through half of your day if you're out and about. The depth of field, having that cool blurry background, this influences low light performance. And usually bigger is better, usually. Um, and then also bigger is typically more expensive. So it's kind of like almost like a, a holy grail for uh, creators like us. We want um, flips out of the way and in video mode, it clicks up. And underneath that mirror is the sensor. So every camera has a sensor. Your smartphone has a sensor. And so when you're thinking about the image quality and things about your camera, you want to think about what's the sensor size. This influences the image quality, the depth of field, having that cool blurry background. This influences low light performance. And usually bigger is better, usually. Um, and then also bigger is typically more expensive. So it's kind of like almost like a, a holy grail low light performance. And usually bigger is better, usually. Um, and then also bigger is typically more expensive. So it's kind of Okay, so one factor is sensor size. That's number one. And the influences, you gotta look at image quality. Depth of field. Cool, blurry background. Low light performance. 
bigger is better. Now, that may be true, but I am actually looking for a small one. The smaller, the better. But at a not, but something that works better than my phone and has a greater capacity than my phone. Because I'm tired, I'm a little tired of my phone keep losing not enough storage. And I would make videos and then I cannot load them, cannot upload them because I'm out of storage. So that's where the problem is. Kind of like, almost like a, a holy grail for uh, creators like us, we want um, full frame cameras, like a Canon 60 Mark II. One of my favorite cameras is the Sony a7 III. It's a full frame camera. And in addition to the sensor size, the camera itself, it, it just creates beautiful images and photos, partly because it's a full frame camera. Now, you've probably noticed that smartphones are getting so good that even though they have a small sensor, they could still put out really good image quality. But these are just typically what is influencing sensors. Now, check this out. This is like how big a full frame sensor is, okay? Like in a 60 Mark II or a, a, any kind of the, the Mark series, like Mark uh, 5D Mark IV on Canon, um, or like we just mentioned that Sony camera, it's a full frame sensor. Now, this is an APS-C sensor. These are very common. A Canon M50 has an APS-C sensor, the 90D, the 80D, uh, all the Sony A6400s, you know, and the, those A6100, A6700, that's an APS-C sensor. You can see it's almost half the size, smaller than a full frame sensor. Furthermore, if we drop down to like a one inch sensor, that's gonna be like a G7X or like an RX100. So even comparing like an M50 or an M100 to a, a one inch sensor of a G7X or an RX100, different sensor sizes. And then finally, you start realizing how small your smartphone sensor is. Like it's a little tiny guy. And so new technology is, is fitting better image quality into that in different ways they're processing it. But you want to be thinking about the sensor size. And again, the sensor size is going to impact image quality, depth of field, low light performance. It's also going to impact weight. Larger sensor usually means larger, heavier lenses. It costs more money. But that's the first thing that I think about when I think, okay, oh, let's get that camera, it's full frame. We want it to just be that beautiful image, that full frame look, uh, et cetera. And so that's definitely one thing. Number two is video resolution. Like what resolutions does the camera actually shoot? So when we talk about 4K, um, this is how large as an illustration 4K is. I'm actually streaming right now, recording this, and if you have questions about this live streaming setup and what camera I'm using here, it's a GH5. I'll put a link to this live streaming setup. People ask about it. This is 1080p as a stream, though. So really, compared to 4K, this stream is this big, as you can see right here. And so 4K is four times larger than that. Crazy, right? If, if you remember DVDs, come on, shout out in the chat or the comments. If you remember DVDs, and when we got those, we're like, these things are so crispy. That was 480p. That's like this, this, this large, right? And even 720p. So you think about these different sizes. Now even 8K is coming out, and that's that's kind of crazy. And so when we look at this, full HD is typically what uh, a Canon T7i shoots. Even in my opinion, a Canon M50 is really an HD camera. Yes, you can pull 4K out of it, and we've pulled out some beautiful 4K, but you lose so many features, it's hard to really, and it crops in, it's hard to really use it as a uh, 4K camera. So most cameras are still HD. Now, smartphones, the, this iPhone 11 is shooting 4K, 60 frames a second, like no time limit. There's definitely more cameras coming towards 4K. It's pretty expensive still when you still have real true 4K in a higher end camera. And so the M50 will kind of shoot crop 4K. One of the reasons why we love the new Sony's A6100, A6400 and, and up is you get almost uncropped or basically uncropped 4K that um, just is beautiful. Or the GH5, uh, Panasonic has a lot of 4K, like kind of true 4K cameras. The G7, it's like under $500 and it's like a great 4K camera with a really good image quality, kind of hard to use and the autofocus isn't the best. So those are sometimes the sacrifices you make. So you want to think about what resolution do you actually need? 
right? Not only what does it have, what are you actually gonna use? And so HD is, is still standard in my opinion. I think HD is plenty, you can use HD, but 4K is mainstream now on TVs and phones. That's been a big update where um, half of the homes here in the US, in America, going into 2020 have 4K TVs now. All of our smartphones resolution, even though it's not a very big screen, is typically more like a 4K resolution. Monitors are now becoming 4K. So 4K is becoming more mainstream. If you want a future proof, you might be wanting to think about 4K. I still love to shoot tons of stuff in 1080, but 4K is where it's going and it is mainstream. Now 4K also requires a better computer to edit. You know, you always gotta be thinking about these things. Like, do you have the processing power to edit it? Now your smartphone, a newer iPhone can edit 4K right on the phone because it's got the processing power and the way it all works. But a lot of times 4K will slow down your workflow. It'll actually slow you down and hinder you because it requires a lot more computing power. And then shooting in a larger resolution can allow you to crop in while editing. So this is kind of cool. Like, like if you shoot in 4K, remember it's four times larger than 1080p. You can then bring that big file into your timeline and editing and zoom in on things with it still being totally crispy because you shot in 4K, but you didn't even export in, in 4K. And here's kind of what I mean. Here's like an illustration is um, full HD is this big, right? So imagine if we captured this image in 4K, we could zoom in like on the dogs, for example, and they would have full resolution. So in editing, I could crop in on my wife Sonia's face or my face or the dogs because I've got that much resolution in 4K. And I actually, it's kind of a, an emotional day, want to dedicate this stream to our dog, Rosie, who just passed away yesterday on Thanksgiving here in the US. Terrible and awful thing that happened. And so uh, Rosie, we love you. In loving memory of Rosie Cannell, um, we just love you. And uh, this stream and this video is dedicated to you. We'll never forget you. And you know, that kind of makes me think too, about how powerful, you know, we're talking about cameras and tech, but how powerful video and photo is. Is like, we just got to shoot this photo with the Canon G7X and this shoot for our Christmas cards just this last weekend. And it was pretty unexpected. She had a pulmonary heart thing that goes pretty fast once it starts to accelerate. And it's, you know, our hearts are torn up, but we're so thankful that we've got these video clips and these photos. And that's one of the reasons why I love YouTube and just creating content, but also just documenting our life and our family and our memories. It's kind of the power of picking out a really um, the right camera so that you can have powerful memories like this one with Rosie. But anyways, thank you for uh, taking a, a moment to let me talk about that. F's in the chat for Rosie and uh, we'll keep going. So questions to ask when it comes to shooting 4K is also a couple things. You know, a lot of these camera companies, a little act cameras right now it's the holidays and people are, are buying cameras and they claim to have 4k well what you end up learning is like it doesn't there's like 15 frames a second meaning it's barely usable for video it crops in like crazy it looks like garbage it can only record five minute clips of 4k i recommend just grab our think media gear guide that's at thinkgearguide.com there's a link in the description below I'll, I'll, myself and the team we read Tell these cameras to help you just Lens, 1.4 is episode. usually more expensive. 16 is what lenses will stop down on to uh, close or let more light in. You can actually see lens aperture have blades and when it's wide open at 1.4 that's how much light's coming in the camera and when it's stopped down it's like a super sunny day so the image looks right it, it closes down how much light is going in to the sensor basically right so here's what it influences low light performance if you have a, a, they call it actually a faster lens when it's a lower number so 1.4 is a faster lens and it's a brighter lens and so 1.4 lets a ton of light in Depth of field to get that blurry background, you're like, oh, it's a 1.4 or 1.8 lens. It lets it makes the background really, really blurry. This is a G, this is a RX100 um, camera. It starts at 1.8, so people are like, oh man, that point shoot not only is going to be good at nighttime or in the city at night, 
but when I get like kind of close to the face, whoa, it's all the beautiful okay behind you, bokeh, and like it's like uh, you know those blurry street lights or Christmas lights, things like that. When you've got the lower aperture, so low lower number is better, and most lenses can go up pretty much as high as they need to, but it's where they start. Like how low do they start? And lower also is more money. So if you look at a kit lens on like a Canon T7i, it starts at 3.5, okay? And so um, if you look at this Canon lens, look how crazy big this guy is. This is about a $1,600 lens. See, I can see through there. Like, and uh, it's, cr it's a crazy big piece of glass, but it goes to 1.2. So it's this crazy portrait lens that I picked up years ago when I'm shooting weddings. And it, this lens itself costs more than probably most people's entire camera budget, but it's heavy. It's it's 1.2. It more glass or more weight usually goes into as it goes faster. This kit lens usually is thrown in free if you buy a camera. So um, when I look at like point shoot cameras like these, this is why people love the G7X Mark II, the Sony RX105 because they start at 1.8 in a point and shoot and they go to 1.2 no matter how far you zoom in, which 1.2 uh, or 2.8. And so it's, it becomes still great in low light, still nice, good for portrait photography. In fact, that picture of Rosie that we do at the family shoot, we were shooting with the G7X. I was far away and I would zoom in at 2.8. So it made like the background light beautiful and made the image itself crispy on just a camera like this, knowing how fast is the lens, how good is the lens. And then you can also see how this affects price. Sony's got like the CyberShot D uh, HX80. So it's like a $300 camera. This has a flip up screen, but it starts at 3.5. And then by the way, when you zoom all the way in, it's 6.4. At nighttime, that's gonna look like garbage. It'll just totally fall apart. Whereas the RX105, it's a little bit on sale right now, but it's it's 1.8 to 2.8, but it's $1,000. So you could probably get it for 850 right now. So you get what you pay for, right? This, we took this photo with a Canon SL2, very affordable camera, but we put that 1.2 lens on it. You can see Omar's crazy blurry, but the camera's in focus. That's the kind of look you get based on aperture. And so ask yourself, what is the starting aperture of your lens? Sometimes smartphones start at like 2.0 now or 2.8. And fixed lens cameras, you can't change it. So you wanna know what's the starting aperture of my lens? And then you want to know, can you upgrade your lenses later? If you if it's an interchangeable camera, then you could just start with the kit lens. But then as you save up money or shop around, refurbish deals or whatever, and you can then keep upgrading your lenses to faster lenses. And then it's your aperture plus sensor that equals low light performance. So Sony's have been known for just like murdering low light. Of course, the A7S, uh, but this is the A7 III. This is our higher end much more expensive uh, camera that we love at Think Media, full frame sensor and really good in low light. And then you combine that with a um, really fast lens and you've got, it's just like a total powerhouse for weddings and commercial videography and, and uh, all kinds of things you could do. But by the time you get an expensive lens in the camera body, you're going to spend three, four, $5,000. And I don't think that's needed for YouTube. That's just kind of illustrating how much you can pay for like a fast aperture type of situation. So ask yourself, can you invest in a good camera body now and upgrade your lenses later? If you want the most versatility, that's a picture of the Canon M50. That's one of our top recommended cameras. It's on sale right now, $600 with the kit lens. You can even find it around $500. We have a few deals linked up in the description. Um, and those are our affiliate links. You've got like Canon refurbished or even eBay's got like 509 for new. But then what you can do with like an M50 is you can actually use lenses that are coming out for that. Sigma has lenses coming out. That's a 1.4, 16 millimeter 1.4 that'll go right on your M50 style camera. But you can also just click on a lens adapter like this and adapt any lens to your M50. And now you could borrow a lens, rent a lens, and get just insane quality if you just had a project that you were working on. And that's why, yes, as, as you're deciding, maybe you want to point and shoot for travel, but if you're only getting one camera, you might want to be able to have different lenses so you can accomplish different things when it comes to creating content. All right, number four, autofocus during video. What I like to look for is face tracking, fast autofocus, it doesn't hunt, and dependable. 
this is huge. I think this is the number one feature, in my opinion, that matters for creating YouTube content for the average person. You know, a lot of people think, oh, this camera is amazing if I like, like tweak this and do this setting and do this hack and do this thing and put like a balloon where my face will be and like get myself in focus. And you could do all that and use whatever you have. But what I look for more than anything is I want just fast autofocus that is set it and forget it pretty much that can track my face. Um, and that's usually going to be Canon with dual pixel and going to be some of the new Sony's. So a lot of these other cameras these days, Panasonic are almost all contrast based. Sure, people are like, you look, this one setting, and you're like, okay, but it's just not the same. And, you know, Nikon's got some what, – what we're talking about here is phase detection versus contrast based. And if you can get it, you want phase detection autofocus. A lot of the Sonys and the newer ones have it very fast, even faster than Canon, it would seem. But then Canon with dual pixel is unstoppable. So the new EOS R and RP, you got, of course, the M50. The fact you get dual pixel in an affordable camera like the M50, flip screen, touch the screen, focuses on your face. That's, these are the kind of things that I think matter for YouTube content. And so if you haven't seen also our main top two camera recommendations for 2020 going forward, I would still say the Sony a6100, which is basically the direct competitor to the M50, or the 6400 has a few more features. And these are the two I'd recommend. One's, this is gonna be around 1,000, and this is going to be around 500. So click or tap the YouTube card or we'll link that up in the description. If you haven't watched that video, I still think that's the best investment going into 2020 for cameras. But number five is I look for audio. Like, does it have a mic input, right? And so the M50s are at Omar's house uh, right now. But I got the M100 here. And it's, it's kind of like an M50 but it doesn't give you a mic input. So you got the interchangeable lenses, but no mic input. The RX100 5, the G7X2 doesn't have a mic input. Now the new one does, but it has some other issues. The new RX100 does, but I don't think it's that great for vlogging. It's more for photography um, and less for YouTube because of what they chose to do with the focal lengths and things. So does it have a mic input? Does it have a headphone output? That's not as common, but um, you know, for a powerhouse camera that 90D does, the ADD does, really more intended for video. And then if not, is it does it have a good on-camera microphone? Like the G7X Mark II is still my number one recommendation for vlog. Um, and less for YouTube because of what they chose to do with the focal lengths and things. So Does it have a mic input? Does it have a headphone output? That's not as common, but um, you know, for a powerhouse camera that 90D does, the 80D does, really more intended for video. And then if not, is it does it have a good on-camera microphone? Like the G7X Mark II is still my number one recommendation for vlogging, period. Now that the cost has come down a little bit, the autofocus is better than the Mark III, and you need autofocus for video. So I just think get the Mark II, even in 2020. And you're going to just use the on-camera microphone. It sounds great. My friends Benji and Judy from It's Judy's Life, uh, that's what they use is the Mark II. And they, they shoot daily vlogs every day. Like travel vloggers around the world, that's what they use. They might also get like a GoPro and a drone, but like it's just good on camera microphone or do you have a camera that has a mic input? And here's the thing, there's a solution to every problem. If you're like, shoot, you've already revealed like I don't have what I need. Look, you can find a solution to every problem. For example, we shot this video on a little Yi 4K action camera. This thing's like 130 bucks, I love this thing. And uh, it was on a gimbal and I wanted to kind of drive and talk, but I wanted better audio. So what I did was I took my dongle, put it in my phone, that turned it into the headphone and uh, microphone input, and just plugged in a $12 Amazon microphone to my phone, started the audio recorder, put my phone in my pocket with the lavalier mic on my shirt, and recorded the audio separate for this video. 
Yes, then it takes some work. You bring it into editing and you put the video in one layer and the audio in another layer and you have an external microphone. Like your smartphone plus plug-in mic in editing is an external microphone. It's more work, so it's nice if you want to speed up to have the Canon M50 with the mic input and just have everything synced together, but never get discouraged because there is a solution to every single problem. All right, number six, size, weight, and build quality. And I add all these together, all these considerations. Size, weight, and build quality. Again, if you get a GoPro, they're amazing these days, but you can't zoom in and take, uh, you know, Too amazing small. portraits with it. Too it's small not the point of it. G7X is great because you can do a lot with it, but you can't ultimately change the lens, um, and, but it is very portable. Then you get into bigger cameras. This GH5 right here is like a tank. It's also indestructible, like to the point of like, is it weatherproofed and things like that? you know, or camcorder or the 90D that has different size and things like that. I love this quote from Chase Jarvis, the best camera is the one that's with you. And so thinking about the size and the weight and the build quality, if the camera doesn't come with you, it's not a good camera. If it's not on you, that's why it's, we're using our phone so much is we're like, we got, I got this amazing camera at home, but if I'm going to walk all day around on traveling with my wife, it, carrying this all day long could be kind of gnarly. So what camera will you take with, with you? I never hesitate to take an RX100, fits in my pocket, and you've got like 4K video, amazing photos, things like that. And so I like to think about, you know, what are you actually gonna use this for? And if you are taking notes, like write that down, like what are you going, what's the intent of this camera? Do you have a budget for multiple cameras? And not that you should, but if you do, then you're like, okay, actually, I wanna get like a nicer kind of mirrorless or DSLR camera, and then maybe an action cam, camera um, and then I and maybe a drone and instead of getting one big camera I, I, I want to travel I want to be able to do different things with it and so don't forget your smartphone too is a camera at, that's part of that kit that that you can combine with your overall setup and then mirrorless cameras can be the best of both worlds because they can be So lightweight they can be so nimble you can expand them up and down depending on your lenses and accessories and then build quality you know the Canon SL2 is a good uh, camera we've talked about and I'll link up the video to SL2 versus the M50 I would choose the M50 but if you want the DSLR um, and kind of build it, it's kind of plasticky if you're gonna shoot makeup videos beauty videos cooking tutorials in your house um, just on a tripod and almost never move the camera, well then you don't really need crazy build quality. But if you're gonna shoot outdoors, take it hiking, take it off road, it's gonna be raining, there's gonna be a lot of dust, then you maybe want a weatherproof body. And I think you know the ADD and the 90D of Canon has that. Um, the GH5 is like built for rugged use and filmmaking so that it really can be, uh, you know, endure a ton of different stuff. So let me know in the comments what, what, what do you need this camera for? Like, what is it that you want this camera to accomplish for you? Uh, trainer says the SL2 never moves off my tripod, so you don't need crazy build quality. I love that. Whereas some, you might say, okay, when I'm going through these 12 things, man, I need it to be like weatherproof. And I, and I want it to be, I need 4K because I want to be future-proofed. And you're kind of then narrowing down what it is you ultimately want. Oliver says G7 versus the M50. Personally, I'd go M50 because the autofocus matters that much to me. I think that I, I, I wouldn't really use the M50 for 4K, but the autofocus matters. I would use the M50 for 1080 for YouTube with the bomb autofocus, easy to use, still an amazing picture quality. 
Um, that's what I would uh, that's what I would rock. And we're actually going to be doing a super Q and A. So please post your questions. We're capturing those about cameras, and um, I want to answer all of your camera questions in that super Q and A. So selfie screen and touch screen. This, of course, this is the YouTube dream, right? This is ideal for YouTube content and vlogging. The touch screen makes things fast and easy. And a power feature is the touch screen for autofocus during video. So the reason I said M50 even over GH, uh, G7 is the G7 kind of has the touch screen. The focus kind of hunts around or whatever. What you need to do is put it in manual focus. This is the GH5. I don't think autofocus is that good on this. I have it locked in manual because I'm just sitting here. I'm not going anywhere. But if I'm going to move around or if I want to hold up something, like this is going to be blurred. And a good dual pixel or phase detection camera will, will focus on your hand or your product that you're reviewing and then come back to you. And so that's why we love the M50, right? Like, does it have a real easy touch screen with really good autofocus during video on that flip screen to selfie? That's, of course, an ideal feature. Number eight, the record time limit. Have you ever seen this? Movie recording has been stopped automatically. This one is one that people don't really talk about. And so... This is a fact. Most DSLRs and mirrorless cameras have a 30 minute record limit. Did you know that? So people are always surprised. They're like, I get these cameras and then I, I want to shoot me painting for two hours and it keeps the camera keeps stopping. Like, what's wrong? Well, they actually have a record limit. Now, the reason for that used to be technology and like buffer files, you know, it was like four gigabytes. The, once the file got too big, it would stop recording. But actually the reason this is, is like that is because there's a tax in Europe on whether a camera is a video camera versus like a photo camera. So by not, by limiting the record limit, they save five to 10% when selling the camera in Europe uh, that they would have to pay as a tax if it's a video camera. And so to this day, that's why camera companies do it. It's not because the cameras can't record longer, but they stop at 30 minutes. So your question is, do you need a record to record clips longer than 30 minutes? If you need to do that consistently, see, for most people on YouTube, it doesn't matter. You shoot for a little while or you restart the camera or you're vlogging, so you just shoot short clips. But if you really need this thing to go on and on and on, then think about the record limit. This is why we love the A6400 because not only does it have a flip screen and great autofocus and a mic input, and you can see we accessorized it with a few different things. We got a video on that. I'll throw that up on the YouTube card. But I also, we bought a couple battery power things that plug into the wall and into the battery power. So it's like a video camera. We use this for our event growth video live here in Vegas, which is a two and a half day event happening in 2020. Videolive.com. And uh, we, we use it for our event. We just use it for a two day mastermind. And we use it. It's beautiful image, but it has no record limit. And then we can plug it into the wall. The battery's never going to die. You can just use the thing on and on and on because Sony agreed basically to pay the tax. Um, to add that feature to this camera, the GH5 that I'm on, it has no record limit. It's more like a video camera. And this also brings us to the question of like a DS, uh, DSLR versus a camcorder. And not a lot of people necessarily talk about camcorders, but actually I got one over here. This is kind of what I started with was this uh, Vixia camera. And I've got a widescreen lens on the front, which is super cool because usually these zoom in quite a bit. And so maybe the best camera for you for YouTube is a camcorder because it usually has all the different features that you need. This one's got a mic input. If you look here on these, these, these can be like right now there's some on Black Friday special at the Canon deals. Um, you got the flip screen that goes to selfie. You got great autofocus. You got a headphone jack. You got a mic input. And the camera's like 280 bucks. Well, Sean, then why aren't more people getting those? The reason why is that the image quality and the look of them at the, on the lower end is nowhere near what you get with like an M50. So it's kind of a trade-off. And if you want to learn a little bit more about that, then definitely check out our video camcorder versus DSLR and I'll break down all those details. All right, number nine, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and NFC. This is very common now that you can connect your camera to your phone. This helps you transfer content to your phone for social media. Use your phone as a remote for your camera. And a power tip here is if your camera doesn't have a selfie screen, you can use the app of your phone. So think about that. Maybe your camera doesn't have a selfie screen. You pop it up on a tripod to shoot YouTube videos. It does have an app and does it have Wi-Fi? Hook up the app and do the remote so you can then sit in your, you know, on your couch, you want to shoot video and see the shot composition 
hit record, stop at record. This is a great feature a lot of people don't think about. They thought, oh, that solves my selfie screen issue. So does your camera have an app, download it, get it all hooked up, get it set up? Does it have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth? And it could be the solution to your selfie screen. Now, number 10 is skill level. More features does not mean better because complexity is the enemy of execution. So you might get the so much camera, but you never create content because you're like, I don't know how to use it. And it doesn't look right. And it looks the, it's not in focus and the white balance, nothing's right. Well, then getting a more user, by the way, a camcorder is going to be more user friendly, maybe a better place to start or a camera like the M50 that actually has like this um, kind of new beginner mode where look, it's like, make it go this way for blurry make it go that way for sharp, you know, like, like simplify it down and you can turn that menu on and off. So a camera like the M50, you can grow into easy to use touchscreen, like watching some of our tutorials. We have a whole a series on it. And, and then you can eventually evolve. It, it can get very complex to where you can make the 4k work and people make films with it and they get the short films with it once they put it on rigs. So you can grow into it. If it can start simple, and not overwhelm you with features, but have enough features, just consider your skill level when picking out a camera. All right, number 11 is image stabilization. Some lenses, maybe you've seen this, got a little stabilizer. There's a couple different levels. There's optical lens, IS, image stabilization. There's electronic IS, and there's IBIS, in-body image stabilization. So when you look at cameras, this is an ADD, and see it says stabilizer on and off. And then it says, IS STM on there. So this is a really great lens because IS means the image stabilization. STM means a stepper motor means it doesn't make go when focusing, but it's focus is smooth with low noise. And then it works great with Canon's dual pixel. And with the, this camera doesn't have image stabilization built in the ADD, but the lens has optical image. It's like a motor in the lens that kind of vibrates the lenses to take out shake and jitter. Now, electronic is the next level, and a lot of times that's a nightmare. Like a lot of times electronic is where it gets like warbly and, and the, you turn on EIS, electronic image stabilization, and it looks terrible. Sometimes people are pulling it off pretty good. And then IBIS is like the newest kind of thing. It's the newest trend right now. Everyone's pumped about it. The Sony a7 III has got like incredible in-body image stabilization. So it's good for photos, good for handheld video, um, and even good for vlogging, although nuts and super heavy to, to vlog on a camera like that. So does it have IS and do you need IS? This brings us to maybe the right camera if you wanna vlog. Going into 2020, I don't think this vlog kit comes out until February of 2020, but I actually think that maybe the GoPro Hero 8 is gonna be like the vlogging camera or certainly one of them because of that little rig there, I can see they're going after vloggers. They're adding this selfie screen you'll be able to, to, to buy, which is nice, you need that. And then you'll be able to have all the different features, 4K, you can add on a microphone, add a little light on, but it's hyper smooth. That is the key here, or like rock study on the DJI Osmo. So even if you're walking around, it, it, the, it's kind of a combination of IBIS, that it can move the lens. Some of it's electric, some of it kind of moves the lens, whatever. This might be the way to take out shake if you're going to vlog. See, a lot of people that are going to shoot YouTube aren't going to vlog. They're going to put it on a tripod, shoot the cooking video, shoot the homeschool book review, shoot, you know, uh, the training business video. Well, then you, you don't need this. But then maybe this is the additional thing. I think actually the Osmo Action camera is insane. I love it. Super good sales going on right now um, on that one as well. And then you got some that combine it. So actually the G7X Mark II and III they have really good electronic and opti optical combined. Crops in a little, but there's really no warping, and so it looks great. The steady shot optical IS on Sony is pretty good as well. So on these point shoots, it's sort of a combination of both, and so you see IS there. That's what IS stands for. And then Sony and other camera brands are, are doing in-body image stabilization. So you can see it's kind of like this motor that's around the sensor that actually moves the sensor to remove shake and stabilize the camera. And so cameras with IBIS, the Sony a6700 has it and you get all the features of the, the earlier ones I mentioned with IBIS as well. It's not the best IBIS, but still it's gonna help. The G-Set GH5 has it. Um, some of the new Olympus and Fuji cameras have it. So a power tip is some cameras utilize both lens IS 
and the in-body image stabilization. So Panasonic has been known to be the best for this. You've got the incredible, like they call it like OIS or something. And then it's combined with the actually IBIS of the camera. And so I remember different YouTube friends shooting like mini documentaries with a lot of handheld footage because of that. Um, but usually this is going to cost you a lot more money. And this is why people want gimbals. And gimbals can be kind of gnarly to carry around. So when you see a camera like this, see, this eliminates the problem because the gimbal is doing the stabilization for you. And then let's not forget that people have been vlogging for years. Like it doesn't have to be perfect. Like it doesn't have to always be super smooth, crazy smooth. And um, but a gimbal makes it like crazy smooth, like cinematic, like takes out all shake if you got the right one. But then you also need to like hit the gym a little more to carry around rigs like that. And then, of course, there's like the uh, the Osmo Mini or whatever that little guy is. Some of the smaller cameras are allowing you to basically have gimbals because they don't weigh that much. And that could be a solution you're looking for if you want to walk around all the time. Now, we got one more tip for you as well as how to save money. But I have a question for you. Are you planning on buying a camera soon? And which model? Let me know in the comments. What camera are you thinking about? What questions do you have for our Super Q&A? And then if you, if you want my straight path to the top cameras I recommend, get the gear guide. Thinkgearguide.com. Link in the description or just type that into a web browser, the word think, the word gear, the word, word guide.com, and uh, we'll send you that. But number 12, before we get to my money saving tips, is frame rate and slow motion. So, frame rate and slow motion. In Europe, kind of the standard is 25p, and in America for television or whatever, it's 30p. Um, and you'll see those as kind of the two most common in a lot of cameras. 24p, as you can see highlighted there. That's also what people sometimes that's the only frame rate available because technically it's less frames per second. What this means is frames per second. The way a video camera works is a photo is click. It's one photo. Video is 24 frames in one second. So 24 pictures in a second. So 24 is less than 30. So it should take less memory and less processing power. But also 24 gives things a look. People call it a film look or a cinematic look. Sometimes cameras just do 24p because they don't even have a more, more option because that's all it can process. Or sometimes it gives you as an option because you want that look on your camera. So you can ask yourself, what frame rates do you need? Um, you know, Canon was under some controversy for the 90D and the G7X Mark III not having 24p. Like they removed it, calling it a cripple. People thought it was a cripple, but then I think they just thought that soccer moms did not need 24p because they announced they're going to add it back to these cameras with the firmware update right around this time. So sometimes they're make, trying to make it even more simple where some people are like, no, I want 24p for the 24p look of it. We here at Think Media, we shoot in 30 pretty much across the board. So we just have like a baseline standard for the frame rate that we use. So when it comes to frame rate, 24 is kind of the film look is why people use it. 30 is kind of just standard and universal. 60 frames are what people are doing for gaming um, and slow motion. So if you look at like a Logitech webcam, this by the way is a great way to also start YouTube. 50 bucks, plug into your cam, uh, 60 bucks, plug it into your laptop, little Logitech webcam. Um, and there's, there's one that gamers love that's the 60 frames a second version. The reason they want that is because even gaming is like higher frame rate and they want their camera to be the same frame rate of what they're streaming at so you can see the game more clearly. Um, the less frames per second, kind of the more blur and the more frames, the more it looks like absolutely lifelike. Like if you shoot your vlogs in 60, it has like a certain look to it. And then also this is considered for slow motion because if you shoot your footage in 60, but you edit in 30, then you could make it 50% slower. And then if your camera has 120 or more frames per second, then you could edit in 30 and make your footage 4x slower. So one of the reasons we love the A6400 camera from Sony, this isn't it, but one like that, is we could shoot 120 and then get that crazy slow motion shot and you wouldn't use the audio probably, but you'd have those dope Peter McKinnon B-roll vibes, slow again, slow again. And, and so if you want to do that kind of stuff, then you're asking yourself, does the camera have the frame rate or the slow motion that I want. Now remember, single most 
important camera, the single most important component of a camera is the 12 inches behind it. If you've never heard of Ansel Adams, he's one of the legendary photographers uh, in history. And he's saying, look, when we get to this point when it's, it's, it's really not about the camera, it's about the content and it's not so much about the camera, it's about the creator. The single most important component of a camera is the 12 inches behind it. So use what you have and level up as you go. But I want to talk about how to save money and a couple different ways to save money. So number one is don't buy the newest models. Like you really don't need them. And what's cool is that whenever a new model comes out, it pushes the price down potentially of an older model or people want to get rid of their older model to buy the newest thing. You don't got to keep up with the Joneses. You can make amazing content by looking at older models of cameras. Tip number two, don't, uh, you, could, you could buy refurbished. And I love, we've linked to a couple sites. There's, I'll show you in a second, Amazon Renewed, Canon. Um, these places have warranties. So you really are getting it just as good as if it was new, but you're saving because somebody returned it or they didn't use it and it's still going to work for you, but you pay a fraction of the cost. And then also don't overspend on features you don't need. I see this all the time. People overbuy on camera or overbuy on lenses and don't have money for accessories. Or they just overbuy, period, and they don't need those features, and they could have invested that money elsewhere. You also potentially got to think about, what am I going to edit on? Do I need software? Do I need a computer? Um, and we've got videos about building out kind of an entire YouTube studio, thinking about that bigger picture. So you don't want to overspend on features of one camera when you want to build an empire and build your business and have the gear to really build momentum in the content that you're creating. And so those are a couple, a few tips. And then... Here's a money saving tip. Instead of buying a camera, consider using your phone and accessorizing it. Now, the weakness to a phone, people are saying like, oh, the iPhone 11 is better than the G7X footage. I'm like, yeah, but for vlogging, you need the selfie camera. And the selfie camera is not as good. It's always worse. It's the one pointing at you. Sure, on this side, it's things are great. And then I'm like, and plus, I don't want to fill my phone up with footage and then transfer it and then delete it. And then how do I manage it? I want to capture all the footage on an SD card. And so there's reasons. Think about your reasoning. But if you can create a workflow on your phone, you've already got an amazing camera that you can start creating content with. And guess what? You can shoot, edit, upload all from your phone. We got a four part series on it. I'll link it up. Like that's a no miss series. Shoot, edit, upload. We did it with Heather Torres on our team. She shows you the apps, how to use your phone, accessories to use how to edit, how to upload it on YouTube, all from your phone, right? And so we've got a video on also video gear under 20 bucks. You can plug a mic in your phone, lighting on your phone, a little rig around it. So click or tap the YouTube card to see that. That video is in the description below as well. And then when I think about saving money, um, here's an example of like Amazon Warehouse Renewed. So you get like a 90 day warranty with Renewed on Amazon. And so the Canon M50 Renewed is, is 507 even cheaper than 600, which is already on sale at the time of shooting this video. Warehouse, Amazon does this all the time. It's like new in box. Maybe you still get the warranty. The box is just open, the box is damaged. You're like, cool, Like, uh, let me, let's rock and roll. And you can get some big savings and the camera's in perfect condition. Um, also, Canon refurbished. Check out, there actually is a link in the description to the deals that are happening here. Not only is it always a great deal and it's available year round, however, the cameras don't stay in stock for very long, um, but there's also, uh, some incredible deals happening right now on the Canon M50, on the SL2, on some cameras that you may, even the EOS R, and some really great cameras that you could save even more when doing, you know, refurbished. Um, eBay is another one. And when I think about eBay, just make sure that you've got good shipping for not only free shipping to you potentially, but also if they accept returns, because you just don't want to get in a situation. You know, here is new inbox 510 for an M50. And so something to check out, but if you get stuck with a camera or like a bad whatever, that's kind of why I like Canon or Amazon or B&H used section because these are reputable brands that if it doesn't work out, you can send it right back to them. You know, like, whereas on eBay, you're like, it's just some dude, he's living in his mom's basement and he made some promises, but you can't trust him. You know what I mean? Like that guy, that guy in his mom's basement, it's tough. So um, those are the 12 tips as well as some money saving tips. Uh, for this. And if you have some questions, we're going to do some a super Q and a, but I also, I would love it if you want to send me questions on any of the social platforms on Instagram, I'm at Sean Cannell. 
um, on LinkedIn, add me there, Twitter, tweet me a question, uh, or Facebook, at Sean Cannell everywhere. Make sure you're subscribed here on Think Media for more videos uh, like this. this as well. And um, we're going to be doing a super Q&A in about two hours. So I'm collecting all your camera questions. And so get those in. And then also, if you have not watched the um, Canon M50 versus the a6400, and you're looking for like trying to make a decision on what's the best camera for YouTube, those are my two top picks. And so click or tap the screen to watch that video. And I will see you in the next video. So these cameras both have a lot of differences, but they also have a lot of things in common that make them perfect cameras for YouTube and content creating. So let's get into that. So both of these cameras have a flip out screen or a flip up screen. So if you're vlogging or if you're just creating by yourself, you can you can see yourself. Uh, they also have incredible autofocus, so you don't. When a stuffy nose closes in. All right. I'm gonna go to sleep. Open your nose. Up to Looks like more than cold the Canon M50 is the best choice, according to uh, John Cannon.